This is NDTV. And you're watching Classics. Hello and welcome to the Unstoppable Indians. Every week we take a journey into the life of an outstanding Indian. A person whose talent, acumen or moral example is transforming India. The best, the finest from every field join me, Manvi Dhillon, on this show to share their life story, their journey to success, some of the knocks along the way, what made them get up and keep going, what makes them an unstoppable Indian. My guest today is a huge force in the Right to Information campaign. He is the founder and the head of Parivartan, an organization that's working on better governance. And with India right in the middle of a critical general election, my guest is urging people to do more than just vote. Demand Swaraj, says Arvind Kejriwal. For ordinary people, it is the everyday corruption that demoralizes them. That's why Arvind Kejriwal, a former officer of the Indian Revenue Service, set up Parivartan, a people's movement that campaigns for change. Arvind's biggest weapon is the Right to Information Act. He urges citizens to use information to demand accountability from government. He wants better governance. His ultimate objective is governance by the community. In 2006, Arvind was awarded the Ramon Magasese Award for Emergent Leadership. Arvind, thank you very much for joining me on The Unstoppable Indians. Thank you. Your message these days is, you can do much more than just vote. Demand Swaraj. What does that mean? Uh, basically, we have tried every political party and we have tried every political leader in the last 60 years, but things have gone from bad to worse. So what we are saying is that merely changing parties and changing leaders won't help. Demand that we need self-governance and vote for the party which empowers people rather than empowering themselves. Basically, it means that in rural areas, Gram Sabha, which is the general body of all the voters put together in that village, and in urban areas, Mohalla Sabha, general body of all the voters in that particular Mohalla or colony put together. These assemblies, people's assemblies, should be given complete power to handle their own affairs, to take decisions about all the affairs in that particular area. But you know, there is a constitutional amendment that actually guarantees our right to self-governance. It's there in paper, but to operationalize it on the ground, and for me as an ordinary voter, to imagine that I can actually be a part of the governance process is an intimidating concept, isn't it? Uh, the constitutional amendments that you're talking of, yes, the constitution says, firstly it says more than the amendments, it says we are a democracy, by the people, of the people, for the people. Where are the people? Once in five years we just go and vote, and next five years we just plead and plead before the same people, before the bureaucrats and before the politicians. The uh, amendments that you're talking of, 73rd and 74th uh, constitutional amendments, they do say that it will be self-rule, it will be the people's role, it will be local self-governance. However, it exists only on paper. What we are saying is that what we need is that people's assemblies need to be empowered. In these constitutional amendments also, when they were actually implemented, it was the representatives, the sarpanch, the panchayat members, the municipal councillors in urban areas, they were given the power and they turned corrupt. Yesterday, people were helpless before MLAs and MPs. Today, they are helpless before the councillors and sarpanch. So people's assemblies have to be empowered so that they decide how the government fund will be spent in their area. They decide the priorities. And if any government servant does not function properly, the people's assemblies should have the power to summon the officer and to penalize the officer. For instance, if a school teacher does not come to the school or is not teaching properly in a government school, the people should have the power to summon the teacher and penalize him if, uh, if required. Madhya Pradesh government in 2002 amended the Panchayati Raj Act and gave this power to the Gram Sabhas. And it had a, it had a huge impact. In some of the villages that we went to in Madhya Pradesh, in Amarwada block, in Chindwada district, three villages that I went to, there the teacher never used to come earlier to the school. He would just come at the end of the month and he would collect his salary. When this amendment was brought in, the Gram Sabha people met 
they withheld the salary of the teacher and two months later the teacher started coming started coming to school it's so so the people should be able to summon their government doctor the people should be able to cancel the shop of the russian shopkeeper or the people should be able to summon the sho if he doesn't register your case if he doesn't he, they should be able to summon the junior engineer if he does if he makes a bad road for you they should be able to summon your sanitary supervisor if he does not clean your area properly the entire local governance should be in the hands of the people you've traveled extensively around india and I'm sure you have seen enough heartening examples of self-governance like the one you referred to in Madhya Pradesh. Today I want you to share yet another example like that because I think that change is initiated through such examples of success. Is there anything that comes to your mind as an outstanding example of self-governance? There are several of them. There are several from present India, there are several from ancient India, there are several from US, from Brazil, from Switzerland. There are several examples. First, people say that democracy is a modern concept. It's not a modern concept. Democracy in India has existed since Buddha's time. In Buddha, in Buddha's time, the son of a king became the king. The people did not vote the government in power. But that's it, after that, the people had the power to be able to participate in day-to-day -day affairs. In many villages and in many states, it is the people's assemblies who used to take the decisions on day-to-day -day governance issues, and the king and the prince, they were obliged to follow those decisions. And there are several examples which are, if you just do a Google search, there are several examples from Buddha's life where Siddharth Gautam and his father, they are sitting, the village is sitting, the village takes a decision despite against the wishes of the king, but the king has no say. But and all of that changed in 1830. The, all of that changed, and it, it was like this till 1830 that in many parts of the country, the village assemblies governed their own villages. The people who invaded India, they only controlled the central government, and they did not affect the village administration. They would only affect the taxation rates that they collected from the villages. In 1830, the then acting governor general, Lord Metcalf, writes in these many words that the foundation of India is these village assemblies. And if British want to conquer India, they have to demolish these village assemblies. And British demolished these village assemblies. They brought in collector Raj. The, these collectors were all British bureaucrats. And the power was taken away from the village assemblies, from the people's assemblies, and it was given to the collector. Unfortunately, at the time of independence, we did not restore this power back to the people. We only reinforced we the only bureaucracy. We only reinforced the bureaucrats till such time that the people are given the real powers to be able to take decisions about their own lives, about their own surroundings, about their own society. I don't really think that there is a hope for a change. Back to the election process, and here I'll give you a simple example. You know, so many people one meets, they say, I don't want to vote for any of the candidates in my constituency, and yet I don't want to boycott the election process. I want that column in the ballot paper which says none of the above. And to be fair to the election commission, it's actually brought up the suggestion and no government is really going to uh, support it, is it? Yeah, true. I mean, it's extremely important, but this is just one of the several reforms that need to be done. In fact, I think Nevada in US is the only state which has this kind of a system where you have none of the above and if none of the polls a majority, then I think the uh, all the candidates, uh, it, there's a repoll in that particular place. Uh, I just want to give you examples. I mean, I gave you examples from ancient India, but how does it work in other countries? I mean, some people might say that that was ancient India. It doesn't, I'll give you an example from US. In US, at the local level, the democracy is so strong that in any city, the decisions for any single decision that the municipality takes, there is a written notice that is given out to all the residents. There is a meeting in town hall. There is a public hearing. And the decisions are taken by the people in the town hall. For almost, for instance, I'll give you an example. Walmart wants to come to India. Now, there is a, there is a concern in some sections of the society that if Walmart comes, that would lead to unemployment. Whether it will lead to unemployment or not is a separate issue. I'm not debating on that. But who takes the decision whether Walmart should come to India or not? In our country, it is the Prime Minister and the Commerce Minister. That's it. No one asks us whether they, we want Walmart or not. Same Walmart, which is a US company, wanted to set up a shop in Oregon. In Oregon, a written notice was given to all the residents. They gathered in town hall. And in town hall, they decided that if Walmart comes to Oregon, then it will lead to unemployment. And there was no Walmart in Oregon. There is no Walmart till today. But you know, I want to, I wanna, I'm playing the role of the cynic here. And let me draw upon an example that is personal to you. 
um, in Koshambi, you know, there was a poor state of municipal services. You, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you spoke to the residents there and you said, well, don't pay your property taxes until the municipal authorities come and fix what is wrong. That threat, did it bring about change? You see, uh, it was very interesting. We did a, cal for, uh, for three years, we were struggling in our own area. We wrote 300 letters to the municipal commissioner and to the mayor. They did not pay attention to that. They did not respond to that. Then we went and met them and we, they said there are no funds. I filed an RTI application asking how much money has been spent and I was shocked to know that they said 42 lakh rupees has been spent to repair the road right in front of my house. And the road does not exist. There is no road there. So that was all eaten up. So that means the funds are there. They are all being siphoned off. So we spread this information all over Koshambi and people decided let's stop paying a house tax. Why are we paying house tax for? For six services and all these water, sewer, sanitation, horticulture, street lights, etc. All these six services are in complete state of dilapidation. So why are we paying this house, this house tax? So we wrote to the municipal commissioner that you hand over these services to us. We will run these services and whatever house tax is being collected from our area, you decide that 10%, 20%, 30% of this will be spent in your area. But we will take the decision on how this money will be spent on in our area. We will decide the priorities. Initially, he agreed. And on the basis of his assurance, we handed over all our profit. I went, a team of the people there, the doctors, the lawyers, six, seven people went house to house collecting house tax checks from the people. And we were surprised that when we went to collect the checks, some people said they hadn't paid their taxes for the last 10 years. And they were ready to pay arrears They were now. ready to pay arrears now. We said, why didn't you pay your taxes earlier? They said, because no one came to our house. Or some people said the clerk came and he said, you give me 2,000 bucks, I'll vanish, uh, your file would be uh, misplaced. So we, when, but when we went, they gave us 10 years of checks. So we were able to collect substantial amount of tax and we handed over that, uh, those checks to those people, but they went back on their word and they said that they will not hand over these services. So it's not going to be easy. The bureaucrats and the politicians are going to try very hard not to give power to the people. I just want to add here, if you pick up the manifesto of all the political parties today, no one is saying that they will empower the people. One party is saying we'll give two rupees a kg of wheat. Another party is saying we'll give income tax exemption. Another party is saying we'll give three rupees a kg of rice. Are the people beggars or something? I mean, the entire country is being treated as, a beg as beggars. And these people are talking as if they are the custodians of this. This money belongs to them. It doesn't belong to them. One person from Delhi, from West Delhi is saying, if I come to power, I'll, be, I'll build a sports stadium. This money doesn't belong to you. You should ask the people, what do they what want? What would they like? Do no they want a hospital or a sports stadium or a school? Or a school.